Lastly, I just want to thank the people who were um, a part of Serving Saturday yesterday. If you were a part of Serving Saturday, would you please stand? If you were a part of yesterday's uh, serving stuff, let's thank them for what they did to serve the Lord. And if you see someone that you know, um, ask them in your D group because uh, these are the places that uh, they went. City on a Hill, Ebenezer Stone, Hope Street, and Souls for Jesus. And uh, just a great ministry. Uh, my apologies for not able to be with you, but uh, our son Stuart had his first swim meet at Northwestern University, so uh, our family was down there uh, supporting him and encouraging him. So uh, really proud of you guys for being a part of that, and uh, hopefully you were a blessing to the people you met. Uh, here's what we're going to talk about today, and then I'm going to push uh, play in my own heart to get ready to preach a, a long uh, section, but we're going to go through it really quick because I want you to talk about this in D group because the topic today is the gospel starts to go in the direction of people that the Jews don't like. I don't know if you have people in your world that you don't like, people that have been maybe mean to you, or you're like, well, I hope, I hope this, this person gets what they deserve, whatever it might be. Um, what happens in this section is a little bit of a, a jolt to everybody who has ears to hear because they're going to be reminded it's God's church and he gets to call the shots of who gets to come to his table. We don't. We think we do, but we don't. And so what you're going to see in this section is some broken people, unlikely people, all who truly re receive Christ have their lives changed and the gospel starts to change its rhythm and its direction. And so hopefully we can learn some really cool stuff today. But before we do that, let's pray. Father, I thank you and praise you for the students. I thank you and praise you for the leaders. Thank you for this church. Thank you for Pastor Chip's message today on doctrine and preaching the word because uh, it's one of the reasons this church, you've allowed this church to be healthy. Uh, we stay, I pray, faithful to your word because it's your church, Jesus. It's not ours. We just want to do what you told us to do. And so as we go into this new chapter of uh, eight and nine of the book of Acts, I pray that we would have hearts that are willing to hear what you want to teach us so that we could live the life you want us to live in ways that shatter some of our stereotypes of people that were maybe resistant to love, but maybe your Holy Spirit is prompting us to love to Jesus just as you've done to us. So if there are people here today that have never trusted Christ to be their savior, pray that today's the day that they do it. And for those of us who have, I pray, Lord, that we would grow in our ability to be much sharper in our ability to preach the truth, know where it says what it says, and how we can help other people know that same truth that has transformed us and continues to transform us. Father, we continue to lift the people in, uh, in Florida and North Carolina to you who've suffered all kinds of disaster in their communities, and we continue to pray for Israel and all the battles that are going on on that side of the world. Lord, we love you. Help us to know our calling and help us to live in it in a courageous and compassionate way. In Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. So if you look at the front page of your notes, you'll see at the top, the short study is scripture mapping. I'm going to teach you something a little bit today that I've talked to you about, but I'm not sure all of you do it. And uh, hopefully you will do it after we talk about it today. And then you're going to see uh, the transformation. Scripture mapping is mainly in Acts chapter 8. And then in Acts chapter 9, we're going to see the famous transformation of one of the most important people in the Bible next to Jesus. He wrote an incredible amount of books in the New Testament because his life was so changed. And we're going to talk about him um, in chapter 9 and, and the chapters following. You're also going to see um, a little bit of how you do this scripture mapping. I've given you the, the main verse here in verse 35 uh, that we're going to tell that story in a little bit. And then you jump down to the bonus section and you'll see that uh, this area of Samaritans, basically the people who lived in Samaria, we're going to show you a map, talk about that. And then the salvation to Gentiles, there's a little description here both in your notes and a little deeper into your notes that I'd like you to look at on your own time for the sake of time. Flip the page over again, you will see this map that we've shown you multiple times um, and essentially today is the day it starts to grow. It's now going to go outside of Jerusalem. The gospel is going to go outside of Jerusalem to Judea, then to Samaria, and soon to the ends of the earth at that time in history. But if you look underneath in the bottom section of your notes, I've given you some of the verses 
in the book of Acts so far to show you how the number of believers have increased um, in a fairly significant way and in a fast way. So we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, the famous uh, Pentecost sermon that Peter preached, 3,000 were added to their number that day. We read that. Then we read a little bit further um, in verse uh, 4 of chapter 4, that the number grew to uh, number of men grew to about 5,000. And then we kept reading over and over through this sequence. And as I told you last week, about this time, scholars believe that the church itself was about 10 to 20,000 people strong, which is the perfect number, so to speak, for God to now say, some of you are going to stay put and some of you are going to go out. And he starts to share uh, the truth with other people and some of these unlikely people that we're about to hear. So flip the page over to 58. And you'll see that the church is persecuted and scattered in 1 through 3. 4 through 8, Philip um, talks to a person. He heads to Samaria. And then we see Simon the sorcerer and then Philip the Ethiopian. We're going to talk a little bit about those fairly quickly. But what I want you to see is look under the, the section of the death of Stephen, okay, under overview, the death of Stephen seemed to be a defeat for the church, but it resulted in some great victories for the Lord. You go a little further on, in that same paragraph, it says, Stephen's witness made a tremendous impression on Saul, and it was instrumental in his conversion. So when we look at this story, as we're going to see in a little bit, it's important for us not to think that when we were defeated, we were ultimately defeated. Sometimes failure actually is the platform by which God springs us to a whole different level of maturity. Then you're going to see Philip is this guy. Uh, if you remember when they gave the list of the pick seven people to go and do the work of ministry, Stephen was the first person on the list. Philip was the second. And this is the guy we're talking about. The Holy Spirit was present in his life in such a way that people noticed something different about him, and God uses him to heal some ancient divisions with the people of Samaria. And so what happens here is we see a more global God in these chapters. And one of the things that I will tell you about the body of Christ, because most of you haven't been outside this country, I've been blessed to be outside this country numerous times, and when I've been around people in different cultures and see them worshiping Jesus, and their skin color's different, their height's different, their education's different, all kinds of stuff is different. But one thing's the same. All of these people have been forgiven, and they want to sing praise to the God who forgave them. And there's like this bond, even though you might not even have the same language, there's this bond that you actually feel like you're a brother or sister to that person. And it's pretty awesome. It's pretty powerful. And so that's what we get to see in this section here. There's a section on Peter's missionary journeys, things like that you can get to. But go to page 59. And so this is where we left off yesterday or last Sunday. And I'm going to give you your first fill in the blank in just a second. But if you remember from last week, we talked about the scriptures have a story in chapter 7. The scriptures have a scene or a storyboard, which is what Stephen talked about. The scriptures point to a savior, which is what Stephen was preaching about. And then we see that the scriptures have stories upon stories of people that we're going to read about today that become from Saul to Paul. And so if you remember in this sequence, here's your first fill in the blank for this morning. The Holy Spirit reaches even the Samaritans. And we're going to get in a little bit more detail about that. But I want to remind you, last week we talked about that Stephen preaches one of the longest sermons in the Bible, and he's constantly mapping out what the Old Testament talked about, but then at the end of his sermon, he didn't get a great, you know, applause and all that kind of stuff. He got the complete opposite. People picked up rocks, jagged rocks like this. You can imagine what it would feel like to preach what he preached and then have people pick this up when you're close to done, knowing what's about to happen to you. And if you remember what it said, they recognized that Stephen's face looked like the face of an angel, even though he was about to die and people were going to basically take him out. So when you get down to it, look what we see in verse one. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. This is the guy we're going to talk about in chapter nine. It says, on that day, great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. 
God uses this one situation of Stephen and starts to basically multiply believers to other regions of that part of the world. So it says in verse 2, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. You can imagine the people that were sitting there and, and struggling with this. God, why did you allow this to happen? It's a fair question. And so verse 3, we see, but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house, and he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Saul is not slightly committed to persecuting the church. He's fully committed. You'll see under 1.3 of verse 3, it says, the persecution which seemed to be a negative was in reality a positive factor. It led to the first great missionary outreach by the early church, and Satan's attempt to stamp out churches The church's fire merely scattered the embers and started new fires around the world. In the words of the early church father, Tertullian, the blood of the martyrs became the seed of the church. It's a great quote from John MacArthur. There's this idea that what the enemy said, we're going to squelch the church, we're going to keep it from growing, we're going to keep it from growing, and what it did is the complete opposite. It actually caused it to multiply. So we see this develop. And then we get to 4 through 8. Philip is in Samaria. Um, he's going to preach about the Messiah. Go to page 60. It says in verse 4, Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to his city in Samaria and proclaimed Christ there. When he's in Samaria, go down to 2.2 under verse 5. The city of Samaria, okay, I want you to understand this. This is why this is the hated people. Israel had been divided into three main regions. Galilee in the north... Samaria in the middle, and Judea in the south. The city of Samaria had been the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel in the days of the divided kingdom, before it was conquered by Assyria. And if you've been with us, you know what we're talking about on that. Then go a little further, it says, These foreigners intermarried with the Jews who were left, and they mixed races between, uh, became known as the Samaritans. Samaritans were considered half-breeds, but the pure Jews were in the southern kingdom of Judah. So there was intense hatred between the two groups. But Jesus himself went into Samaria in John 4 and commanded his followers to spread the gospel. So here's the map related to this so that it makes more sense. Here's Jerusalem. And when we hear it's going to go into Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, Jerusalem, then Judea, bigger circle, Samaria, bigger circle, and then to the ends of the earth. Okay, For you to get to Galilee... To get to Nazareth, you have to go through this area unless you want to go all the way out here. So most people tried to avoid this section, and the Samaritans were called to be um, loved by God just as much as the original, more sanctified Jews in the south. So the, the Jews basically down here thought that they were superior to the Jews here because of their intermarrying, and basically this section is going to say otherwise. This section is going to say, no, no one's beyond God's reach if they, if they call on the name of Jesus. So here's what we end up seeing. Verse uh, 6, Philip saw the, mirac- the people saw that Philip did miraculous signs, and they paid attention to what he said. There were shrieks and evil spirits came out. Many paral- uh, paralytics and cripples were healed, and there was great joy in the city. People are getting fired up. Like, this is amazing. Lives are being changed. And again, if you were witnessing this live, it would rock you would absolutely rock you. But then what ends up happening is Simon the sorcerer, kinds of, he kind of likes this. He's like, whoa, this is pretty cool, Philip. That's pretty cool power. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all of it, but Philip's impacted by it so much so that he chooses to be baptized. But if you read in the context, he really doesn't do it for that. He wants the power. It's not about belief. So flip the page over to 61. And so you see this dialogue that goes on because I'm going to have to cover a whole lot more ground. And we have time for. Go to the middle of verse 18, of page 61 of eight, verse 18. It says, Simon saw that the Spirit was given on the laying of the hands of the apostles. And so what does Simon do? He offers them money. Hey, I want that power as if you could buy it. It says, give me this ability, verse 19, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. I want the power. I want to be able to control that. And look what Peter says. May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. 
Verse 21, you have no part of or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Verse 22, repent of, the, of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. And he goes on to explain all these things. And so here's one of the things that's interesting. Go down to verse 24 under 1.1. When people experience the true power of God, it makes the other powers that they thought were powerful seem like counterfeit power. When they see the presence of of followers of Christ do the things that these apostles were doing and these different people were doing that were followers of Jesus, it caused everyone to kind of take a, a good inventory of their own heart. So what ends up happening is verse 25, when they had testified Uh, and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in the many um, Samaritan villages. So what ends up happening is, if the top part of verse 14, Peter and John are told to come and look at, is this really happening? Is God loving the Samaritans? Could that even be possible? And I promise you, if you know your own heart, there's probably people who've walked in the door of that loft entrance that you're like, what is he doing here? What is she doing here? God could never love them. I guarantee you, almost every person in this room has probably had that thought somewhere at some time, whether it's in the church or in a building somewhere. And this chapter is to remind us all, we don't get to play God and tell him who can and cannot enter his family. Humble is the life that says, God, help me love people, even people that I might not like so that their lives are changed. And so what ends up happening is, what the page over to 62, we get a good example of scripture mapping. Philip basically has now modeled this this lifestyle of following Jesus. He's able to heal people who are sick. They see his power, but it's not his power, it's God's power. And so in the process of all this, He's being told in verse 26, now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Okay, now again, you can look at the map there and you can see Gaza's here, Jerusalem there, and he's told to go all the way over here. Okay, verse 27, so he started out. It's roughly about 50 mile journey, so to speak. He goes there. And when he goes there, he, he sees, verse 27, he started on his way and he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. The name Candace actually means queen uh, for the Ethiopians, not, not from Phine- uh, Phibius and Ferb. So it's, it's, not, it's not that Candace, okay? And so you have this, this person who's got power and prestige, so to speak, And look what he's doing, verse 28. And on his way home and sitting in his chariot, he's reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. He probably bought one of the scrolls. And so he's sitting here like, he's trying to make sense of what's going on in Jerusalem. Something's going on in Jerusalem. I want to see the scrolls. So as he's reading, verse 29, the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And Philip ran to the chariot and heard the man reading the Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked, which is a great way to start. If you ever see someone who's being interested in the faith, don't sit there and just drop everything you've ever learned in your life. Just say, hey, what part do you understand so far? And then just listen. And then look what he says, verse 31. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So what you see here is this passage of Scripture that he's reading is not an accident. Verse 32, then the eunuch was reading the passage of Scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. I've given you verses right underneath here in this section. I want you to look at them. I want you to write in the margin of your Bible or whatever you want in your notes. If you get one shot, one shot to tell people what Jesus did to fulfill the scriptures, it's Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. Write it down in your notes. You want to learn how to scripture map? Okay. This is how you do it. One of the joys I had coaching when I was coaching sports and stuff was teaching people different soccer moves for different reasons. If a person's on this side of you, there were three to four moves I had that you could get free so that you could get a shot off on a goal. I had about even more Uh, moves if a person was on your back. 
And then there's, verse, there's moves that you do going forward, okay? And if you want to be successful at being an athlete on a soccer field, guess what you need to know? You need to know some moves so that you can school your opponent. You don't want your opponent to be more skilled than you. You want to be more skilled than your opponent. You know how you get more skilled than your opponent? You actually train. You train to do things faster, quicker, and know when and where to use them. So if you want to get better than than most people are at knowing their Bible and helping people understand the truth, then here's a good idea. Learn the moves of Scripture. Learn the Scripture map. What are the key chapters? What are the key verses? He happens to be reading the main verse in the Bible that told us the Messiah will come as a suffering servant. So this is a verse you need to write down. If you want to be good at helping lost people come to know Jesus, what's the big deal about Jesus? Well, here's a big deal. Here's a prophecy that was written by Isaiah, the prophet, 700 years before Jesus fulfills it. So it wasn't a bunch of people sitting in a van down by a river, writing a couple things, and then a couple of decades later it got fulfilled. No, we're talking 700 years. And look what the verse says, verse 5 and 6 of Isaiah 53. That he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He knew why he came. He came to die. Jesus knew exactly why he came. And so when you see this, look what it says in verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a, la- like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Guess what happened when he was before Pilate? You know why he didn't defend himself? Because he knew why he was there. He knew why he was there to die, to fulfill the scripture. And so to highlight this even more, flip the page over, top of page 63, I've given you another verse. This is also from the writings of Luke. Luke wrote the book of Acts, and God had him write the book of the Gospel of Luke. Luke 24, 44 through 47, at the top of your notes on page 63, says, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That's why I told you last week, Scripture has one story. It has one hero, one Savior. It's him. And so it says this in verse 45. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures and he told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. This is scripture mapping. This is you actually learning. What does the truth say? So that if you're ever confronted by questions from the opponent, you have a move. You know what to do. You don't have to hide. You don't have to sit here and think, well, I don't know what to do. I used to love, absolutely love, when certain opponents were on this side or that because I knew what to do. And I knew how to do it at game speed. And it was a joy. I'm not saying you're going to sit here and like, well, let me get to this really quick. Here's the part of Isaiah 52 that you you just glance over but it makes me cry every time I read it. Isaiah 52, 13 through 15 says this, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. It's the cross. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. He had been so whipped and so beaten He was almost unrecognizable as a human being. And then it goes on to say, so he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told they will see and what they have not heard they will understand. Because of his act of faithfulness to the Father's will, every person in leadership from the dawn of time to the close of time will bow before his name. His name is so superior to every name 
There is no name even close. Because no one has ever lived love like that. And so when you put all this together, here's what he does. Philip's a stud. God uses Philip, verse 35. Then Philip began with this very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. He basically leads him to Christ. Verse 36, and they traveled along the road and they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. Shouldn't, why shouldn't I be baptized? It'd be awesome if everyone responded that way. I'm not going to delay. I want to say publicly, I belong to Jesus today. And so what you end up seeing, verse 38, he gave orders to stop the chariot. The chariot stopped. And then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Had to be a great day for Philip. And then here's the section we don't have time to get into, verse 39 and 40. Then when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again. But he went on rejoicing. For Philip, this had to be a moment because he's like, guess what? This is a group of people that we called half Jews that Jesus just said, I love them as much as I love you. So when you put all this together, there's this, there's this sequence that's pretty powerful. This group of people were not loved by the Jews and Jesus made it clear that he would love them. And now his disciples were loving them. So when you put all this together, here's your second part of uh, your fill in the blank. The Holy Spirit reaches even the Samaritans and the Holy Spirit reaches all who seek the scriptures. I want you to learn, just like I was blessed to learn soccer moves and just have an absolute blast playing the game. I want you to learn how to scripture map. You need to know if you're ever asked the question, what's the big deal about Jesus and what did he actually fulfill in the Old Testament? Your number one verse to go to is Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. And you read that whole section for them. And then you go right to Luke chapter 24. And you talk about all the law and the Moses and the prophets and the Psalms were written about him. And saying that he will fulfill the scriptures. And so when you put all this together, I want you to understand we're about to witness another miracle. One of the most unlikely people to trust Christ is Saul. So go to page 64 in your notes. And you will see that Luke makes a, a significant pivot in this section. I've given you some stuff in the overview that is worth looking at on your own time because we don't have time to get into all of it. But here's some of the key things you need to know about um, Saul who becomes Paul, okay? Go in the middle uh, of page 64 under 2.1. Saul is his Hebrew name, okay? Saul is what you would call him in Hebrew and Paul is what his name is in Greek. Look at what it says. He was also a Roman citizen. Paul was born about the time of Christ's birth. He came from Tarsus, an important city in the Roman province of Cilicia, located in Asia Minor. And he spent much of his early life in Jerusalem as a student of the celebrated rabbi Gamaliel. We already heard about him earlier in Acts. He was a significant player among the Pharisees. So this guy didn't have just an education. He had like one of the great pedigrees. His resume basically protected him because he's a Roman citizen trained by one of the coaches of the day from the Pharisees standpoint. And he knew the Greek culture. He knew all of this stuff. He was an incredibly balanced person. And here he is persecuting the church. So what do we see? Chapter, or chapter nine, verse one. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest, verse 2, and asked them for letters to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found anyone who had belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might then take them to prison to Jerusalem. So I want to show you, again, this map. Okay? Damascus is not exactly around the corner. It's way up here. So if they fled from Jerusalem to Damascus, it's not just a quick little jaunt. This guy was committed to trying to extinguish the church. And so when you put this together, at the bottom of your notes on page 64, um, the, the phrase that you see, who belonged to the way in verse 2, for the first century, Christianity, one of the phrases people would ask is, are you part of the way? It was kind of a code way of talking about, are you a Christian? Again, mind you, you're getting killed if you have it too publicly known that you're a follower of Christ. And so 
This is the one that they're, they're basically, he's talking about. He's looking for people who are followers of the way. And a lot of people, flip the page over in your notes, a lot of people believe that this is partly because of what Jesus said in John 14, 6, which is in the top of your notes. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He is the gateway to forgiveness. He and he alone. It's only by his name that we're forgiven. So what ends up happening is, you'll see um, a number of things happen here. I've given you a verse under 1 Timothy, under um, just above verse 3. Um, it's, it's a later testimony of Paul in his later part of his ministry, but he talks about himself as the, as the worst of sinners. This guy understood perspective. So we get to verse 3 of chapter 9. He says, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Verse 4, He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Verse 5, Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. What you find here, go to the bottom of that page, 65, under 2.1. Paul refers to this experience as the start of his own new life in Christ. At the center of a wonderful experience, um, with Jesus Christ, Paul did not see a vision. He saw the risen Christ himself. So here's a guy who witnessed, as we read in the very beginning of, of chapter 8, the guy who was sitting there watching Stephen get stoned and celebrating it to this. This is a short time frame. You can only imagine the men who buried Stephen we're thinking, you got to be kidding me. The guy that I saw stoned my, my brother in Christ? He now believes? No way. No way. I was there. But look what happens. Put the page over 66. Verse 6, now get up and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. This is Saul being told by Jesus. Verse 7, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but couldn't see anyone. Verse 8, Saul got up from the ground, but he opened his eyes and he could see nothing. Verse 9, for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Imagine being in Saul's mind. You've stoned Stephen. You've imprisoned followers of the way. Jesus, you get to see the resurrected Christ. He says, why are you persecuting me? And then you go blind? Do you think for a second it might have stirred in his own heart and mind? Is this going to be the new version of my life? I'll bet you couldn't go with your eyes closed for even an hour. Try three days. It would get your attention. So we get to verse 7, Damascus. In Damascus, there's a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. Verse 11, he told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask the man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. You can better believe he's praying. Verse 12, in a vision, you've seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. Verse 13, Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. But notice what happens. Verse 14, and he has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, exclamation point, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and before the people of Israel. Notice Ananias doesn't argue with him. He understands how the Holy Spirit works. So he goes, he does what he's supposed to do. Flip the page over to 67. Verse 16, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. If you have time in your quiet time this week and if you have a tough day, whenever I have a tough day and I tend to complain in my heart and my mind, like I'm sure all of you do at some point, or maybe you're more spiritual than me and you don't ever do that. But when I struggle with stuff, you know, one of the passages I go to in scripture mapping, I go to 2 Corinthians 11. I put it here in your notes. Read the list of what Paul went through to preach the gospel to people who didn't want to hear it. 
It's an unbelievable list. And he saw lives changed, including his own. And so we get to verse 17. It says, Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, notice how he even referenced him, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me to you so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, had some food. Verse uh, 19, after taking some food, he regained his strength. We get to verse 19b, Paul spent, or Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And verse 20, look what happened. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the son of God. They had to be like, dude, are you kidding me right now? What is going on? And so you get to verse 21, all who heard this were astonished and asked, isn't this the man that raised havoc in Jerusalem among all those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them prisoner to be the, to the chief priest? Verse 22, then Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus. And look what he did by proving that Jesus is the Christ. This guy knew the scriptures. He had done his scripture mapping. He knew the moves. He didn't have to be trained anymore. Not in that same way. He didn't know what the moves were for. Now he knew. I don't know if you've ever seen the famous movie Karate Kid. It's an old school movie. Most of you probably have never seen it. There's a scene in the Karate Kid movie that's a classic. Daniel's son is sitting here. He's painting the fence, walks, waxing the car, doing all this stuff for Mr. Miyagi, his trainer, his mentor. And there's one scene in the movie where he's, Daniel's son gets so mad at Mr. Miyagi. Like, what's the deal? Why am I doing all this stuff? I'm not learning any karate. Then Mr. Miyagi starts attacking him and all of a sudden he goes, wax, wax the car, paint the vent, all this stuff. He does all these moves and he realizes, oh my gosh, I know karate. This is amazing. I'm telling you why I'm so proud of you for being here every Sunday and every Wednesday. God's carving in you moves you don't even know how to use yet. And you don't even know their moves. But one day you'll know, just like Daniel's son and Karate Kid, all of a sudden someone's going to ask you a question and by the grace of the Holy Spirit in your life, God's going to prompt you to remember a verse, Isaiah 53, John 14, 6. You're going to know the moves, you're going to know the map, and you're going to be able to help someone go from lost to found, to rebellious against the truth, to a right relationship, the one who's the way, the truth, and the life. It's why I left the game of soccer. Do you know when I left the game of soccer, I literally did something the club, the biggest club in the United States at the time had never done. They had never won the regional cup. Never, never beat all the state champions in the Midwest. My last team did. Teams were pleading with me, you've got to stay and stay coaching soccer. You're just too good at it. And I said, no, this is just a game. I'm going to go coach life because God made it clear. This chapter's closed. I'm no longer going to teach soccer moves. I'm going to teach scripture moves. And I'm going to help people who are lost discover Christ's love. And some people got it. Some people made fun of me. But guess what? If you pay attention, you will have the same awe that I have of things that I did not realize God taught me that he then used to help reach more people with his love. It's the greatest way to live. It's not easy. I struggle with stuff just like you. I needed Pastor Chip's message today, just like you. Hopefully you need this message just like I do. I'm around people who have more money than I'll ever see. Who have different accomplishments and stuff that I think, oh, I, I could have done that. Wish I could have done that. Wish I could have afforded to do that. But the Holy Spirit reminds me, godliness with contentment is great gain. You brought nothing into the world, you can take nothing out of it. You know what you can take out of it? What you did for Jesus. Which translates you from going to thinking you're poor to making you realize you're actually rich. Because the Holy Spirit works in your life. Philip figured it out. And Saul's now figuring it out. And I hope you figure it out. Because the point is, 
Map the scriptures. It teaches truth that trains you. And that's what he did. And so guess what happens? Verse 23. This is almost comical. Verse 23, the bottom of page 67. After many days had gone by, you would think the Jews would figure this out, right? Stephen just said, hey, every prophet God sent you, you killed him. And then, oh, by the way, you killed the Messiah. And the church is still growing. You might want to take note that you could be wrong. Look what happens. Saul, who becomes Paul, preaches that Jesus is the Son of God, proving that Jesus is the Christ. And verse 23, the Jews conspired to kill him. Good night. Talk about stiff-necked people. Flip the page over to 68. So what ends up happening? Saul heard of their plan. Some people helped him go down the wall uh, so that he could sneak out, essentially, and not get killed in Damascus. And verse 27, Barnabas is the person that we'll hear about later who ends up telling the apostles, hey, he really is the real deal. And because Barnabas welcomed him, it all worked out. Verse 28, Saul stayed with them and moved freely about in Jerusalem. And look what it says, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. This guy had been changed. And not only was he changed, God was using his life to change countless other people. So verse 29, he talked and debated with the Grecian Jews but they tried to kill him. If you're going to sign up for Christianity thinking your life's going to get easy, you're misunderstanding what the Bible teaches about it. It's not always easy. But guess what happens? Flip the page over to page 69. 31. Then the church throughout Judea, Samaria, or Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit and it grew in numbers living in the fear of the Lord. So it's unbelievable how all of these things play out, that the reality of of life is happening, that it's just what Acts 1-8 said. It's going to start in Jerusalem, then it's going to go into Judea, then it's going to go to Samaria, and it's going to go to the ends of the earth. And if you and I can understand that, I'm telling you, it changes us. The last part that we have for the sake of time is uh, your last fill in the blank. Wait, I didn't even get the third one. Here's the third one. (laughs) Sorry, my bad. Your third one is the Holy Spirit reaches... Even Saul, who becomes Paul. And we will hear a lot about him. Then we get back to Peter for just a minute or two. But then after this, we mainly see Paul. There's a couple times that we will see Peter. We see Peter a little bit more next week in a game-changing experience he has that needed the church's um, understanding of. We'll get to that next week. But here we see Peter again, and then eventually we spend most of the rest of the book of Acts in the, in the area of Paul. So what do we see here in this final fill in the blank? We see the Holy Spirit reaches the sick and the dead to life. Peter essentially is by a paralytic again in verse 33. And he says to him, Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ, he heals you, get up and take your mat. And immediately, and I just got up and he basically walks away. There's a variety of things I put in your notes on page 69 about the Holy Spirit and how Peter worked. It's worth reading in your quiet time this week. And then we get to page 70, the last section of your notes. And you'll see that there's a lady named Tabitha, but her actual name when it's translated is Dorcas. And you'll see in verse 36, she's one who is always doing good and helping the poor. She was known in her community as doing what Jesus had taught, and that's to love and to care for the sick and the needy, okay? Verse 37, and about the time she became sick and she died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Some people go and get Peter. They say, Peter, please come at once, verse 38. All the, verse 39, all the widows stood around him, uh, the robes and their clothing that Dorcas had made them. So basically, as Peter comes into this scene, he's surrounded by essentially all the different object lessons, so to speak, of what this woman did for these people. They were wearing what she served them to care for. And look what he says, verse 40. Peter sent them all out of the room, just like Jesus did in one of his scenes, with the exception of Peter, James, and John. They got to stay with Jesus when Jesus did this in his ministry. And he got down on one of his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. Verse 41, he took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. 
Then he called the then he called the believers and the widows and presented her to her to them alive. And then it says, verse 42, they became known all over Joppa for the time he was with the tanner of Simon. This last little part is a similar bookend under 1.3 and verse 43. It bookends the, the section we're studying. Peter then goes to the house of Simon the tanner. That means nothing to you, but to a Jew, they're like, wait, Jesus is really changing lives. Because look what it says in the notes. Peter breaks down a cultural barrier again, like Philip did with the Samaritans, by staying with the man whose job was a tanner, basically taking the hides of dead animals, an occupation that was considered unclean to the Jews. And no doubt this Simon was shunned by the members of the local synagogue. God was starting to break down stereotypes and saying, don't you tell me, God the Father, basically saying to his church, who I can and cannot love. I can love Simon the tanner. I'm going to put Peter in his house. I'm going to have Philip meet a eunuch who's like a secondary person in society and I'm going to have him reading the book of Isaiah. And he's just going to happen to see how the map points to Jesus and that anyone who turns to Jesus can have their life healed from the inside out. And then when it gets healed from the inside out, the Holy Spirit lights a fire in you to go and do the same with other people. Here's my closing illustration for you. I know you guys like embarrassing stories about me after I shared the honking of the horn to a woman that wasn't Pastor Jason Hand. You all got pretty excited that I screwed up. So I screwed up again last night. Um, so I thought you would like it and then we're gonna pray. Uh, our son Stuart was home from his swim meet at school and thought, hey, we're gonna hang out. We'll do like a movie night. We'll make, do some popcorn, all that kind of stuff. I thought I'd make all this stuff because having popcorn is kind of fun. And I thought, hey, I'll get the buttery popcorn stuff. I'll sprinkle it on there, get all the things ready to go and stuff. And all of a sudden I start tasting the popcorn. And I'm like, I open the jar and I'm like, I'm going like this. I go to sniff it. And I'm like, is this still good? It's been a while. I go to sniff it and I'm like, oh dear God, what, what did I, oh, what is this? And I'm sitting here and I'd already sprinkled it all over the, the popcorn. So I did it in the wrong order. It's super spicy hot um, dry rub that you put on wings. So this, this, is, this is not buttered, buttered salt that you put on popcorn. This is super hot, spicy stuff you put on wings that I forgot my dad had given me because my dad can't have spicy enough food. Even as he's about to turn 80 soon, he can never have food that's hot enough, spicy hot. So he's like, hey, I'm going to give you guys this. And I, I, it was up by this one area and it looked, it looked just like buttered salt, right? So I sprinkle it all on there and I'm sitting there, put it in my mouth. I'm like, oh dear God, this is uncomfortable. This is hot. I say that to you for this reason. It was hot. Eventually my mouth cooled off. But one of the ways you know that the Holy Spirit's growing Christ's character in you is it starts a fire in you that you can't help but talk about Jesus. You can't help but being sensitive to what he says. Hey, just like he said to Philip, go over there and talk to that person. I know it's scary, but you'll never feel more alive, I promise you. You'll never buy anything that makes you feel more alive than knowing God's going, using your life to bless someone else for the glory of Jesus. I pray that all of our mouths and our lives get on fire because that's why the first century church kept growing. People kept watching these people's lives changed. Let's pray. Father, help us to be people whose lives are changed. Thank you for the example of Philip. Thank you for the example of Peter and certainly for the example of Saul who becomes the Apostle Paul. Father, if there are people here today that have never trusted Jesus to be their Savior, I pray that they'd no longer play games with their faith but to truly repent of their sin. Ask Jesus Christ to wash them clean because of his blood shed on the cross and I pray that they feel a warmth of love and forgiveness through your power of your Holy Spirit that starts a fire on the inside and grows and changes life on the outside. For those of us who've already had the privilege to trust Christ as our Savior, may we step up our game and get better at recognizing the moves you start to carve into our character. Just like you continue to do in our lives every day that we always tend to ignore these things, but one day you'll have it all clicked together. And I pray that we'd have the privilege to share the gospel with people that you put in front of us every single day. And I pray, Lord, that we've earned the right to be heard in ways that lead them to have a change like Saul. 
So be with us now as we talk about these things in our D groups. And Lord, may you get the glory for it. In Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Have a great rest of your week and we will see you guys Wednesday night. Don't forget to sign up for fall retreat. And next week we'll have our mission trip meeting, eight o'clock. Have a great week. Thanks for being here. God bless you guys.